Good evening, welcome back to the channel. It's a full moon, but as you can see, it's also crystal clear. There's still a meteor out and uh, Kuhn here, yesterday he got his first Star Tracker. So we thought, why not? Let's go. <laughs> said uh, Kuhn, he was enthusiastic enough to instantly buy a Star Trekker after our Hindelope adventure. So there it is, uh, it's a Skywatcher Star Adventure 2i I think. 2i, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically the same Star Trekker as me but a more fancy newer version. <laughs> so yeah, we will uh, show you how to set up a Star Trekker because I think I've never showed it on the, on the uh, channel and he's doing it for the first time, so good opportunity. <laughs> So the first thing to do is to set up your tripod as level as possible and on the Sky Adventure itself there's a uh, bubble level there so uh, I don't know if you can see it but uh, his tripod is pretty level. Second thing is to find Polaris or yeah, to set up your tracker roughly north. To find Polaris you can um, most easily find the Big Dipper and if you draw a line between the uh, yeah, top right two stars of the Big Dipper. And you go all the way to Cassiopeia. Then Polaris is somewhere in the middle. I put it in the middle of the frame now. After that you set up your latitude. And we are at 52 degrees. So if you are working with wide angle lenses, say 14 to 24 millimeters, you don't have to be super precise with your polar alignment. But Kuhn here is uh, attempting to photograph Andromeda at uh, 90 millimeters and perhaps even deeper. So yeah, he is now fine tuning his polar alignment. And you do that by uh, yeah, looking into various apps uh, to check where in the reticle Polaris should be exactly for the best polar alignment. Well, and after fine tuning your polar alignment, uh, you're good to go, just don't forget to turn it on. <laughs> so Kuhn has uh, not had any trouble at all finding Andromeda. <laughs> first there shot, first shot, boom. <laughs> He also said there was a comet out still. You have all seen it, internet is flooded with it. I have shot it before, but there was only five minutes of data, so I didn't vlog it. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, going to uh, attempt again tonight to shoot comet C3E2022ZTF thing. The, the green comet, the Neanderthal comet, you know. <laughs> so the comet is now uh, almost exactly overhead. It's really near to uh, the bright star Capella of the star constellation Auriga. I'm uh, going to put on the 135 millimeter lens and um, see how it goes. All right, so that didn't go to plan as usual. <laughs> Yeah, we were uh, just shooting, uh, Kuhn's first shots of Andromeda were rolling in. I was uh, just polar aligned and then we saw a car coming to us. So bright headlights on and uh, he asked, what are you doing here? Well, oh, you're astrophotography, etc, etc, you know the drill. And uh, yeah, we weren't supposed to be there. Apparently we're, we were uh, just a bit too far from the road. So uh, yeah, we asked uh, if we could stand on a bicycle path, which was uh, yeah, just 300 meters uh, the other way around. So uh, he agreed, so that's where we are standing now. But uh, yeah, that's okay, uh, because it's um, yeah, still pretty dark here. Uh, we don't need any foregrounds, because we are mainly uh, shooting some uh, deep sky, or sort of semi-deep sky at 90 millimeters and 100, uh, 135 millimeters. Yeah, the Comet, uh, I'm shooting the Comet now. Uh, I'm making exposures of uh, 1 minute f2.8 ISO 800 and that looks good on the uh, 135. Um, 40 minutes, uh, Kuhn has done Andromeda, is now shooting uh, the uh, Orion Nebula. Um, yeah, all looks good. So in the meantime, you can see perhaps the moon is rising. So uh, it's almost time to make some calibration frames. And I'll come back to that. Yeah, 
Yeah, so for the people uh, who are wondering how the Comet looks like at 135 millimeters on a raw file, uh, I see a lot of disappointment online, but uh, yeah, this is kind of realistic. <laughs> you do see, if you zoom in, the green and a little bit of the tail. Um, but I know in post-processing you can uh, stretch a lot out of it. So what are these calibration frames? Well, I don't use calibration frames when I'm shooting wide angle, shooting Milky Way, because I think it's a bit overkill uh, and the results are pretty good. But if you are making deep sky photos, you um, are yeah, stretching the data a lot. And everything which is not okay with your data, like vignetting or noise, uh, you really start to notice it when you stretch it. So there are basically three sets of calibration frames uh, which make your light frames as your normal photographs are called, make them better so that you have more clean data to work with. The first and probably the most important calibration frames are your dark frames. Your dark frames, uh, yeah, you basically shoot the dark frames at exactly the same settings as your light frames and uh, they serve to uh, cancel all the random noise which uh, comes onto your sensor. So uh, yeah, if you expose for long times you get some hot pixels, you get some cold pixels and all that stuff you don't want. I'm now walking off the path because I don't see anything because I have a large light in my head. Uh, but yeah, so dark frames. Uh, you just uh, put your lens cap on and you shoot at exactly the same settings to get a more clean result. There are also bias frames and bias frames are uh, to uh, clean up the read noise of your camera. Uh, bias frames uh, are basically also uh, made with your lens cap on and uh, you make them as short as possible, uh, most of the time one eight thousandth or one four thousandth of a second. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so basically if you photograph it, you only photograph that um, read noise and there is no light at all. The final set of uh, calibration frames you need are flat frames. Flat frames are also called vignette frames, uh, mainly used uh, to um, compensate or to clean up your vignette to get a totally flat field because a vignette gets really noticeable uh, if you stretch your data and they also cancel dust spots. I'll show you uh, how I make uh, flat frames back home uh, with a t-shirt over my lens uh, in front of my uh, computer screen. And it is really important that you don't touch your focus ring in the meantime. You have to have exactly the same focus as you shot your shots on location. So we shot our calibration frames. Um, yeah, you can see the moon rising behind us, I think. I hope. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it was uh, yeah, pretty short. We had about 30 minutes of not really astro darkness, but almost astro darkness uh, before, uh, before the moon uh, rose. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, your first time with the Star Trekker went pretty smooth, but uh, yeah. what are your experiences? <laughs> it, it was awesome. So uh, setting up the Star Trekker was uh, much easier than I would expect it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, seeing Andromeda this clear on the back of my screen already is, is really cool. So I'm yeah. really looking forward to uh, post-processing them. Looking forward to your uh, results. It looked really good at the back of the screen already. So uh, yeah, if the shots turn out to be any good, here are the results. <laughs> Let's first take a look at the result of Andromeda from Kuhn, which he shot this evening. Uh, I think his first time with the Star Trekker went really smooth. Uh, he shot Andromeda uh, 21 times 50 seconds at f2.8 and 90 millimeters. Uh, he cropped this result into about 200 millimeters to show a bit more detail. Yeah, I think this is just incredible for a first time. For myself this evening I wasn't really that happy about my results of the Comet. Uh, I did make a pretty nice time lapse however uh, where you can see the Comet traveling through the stars. Uh, but yeah, full moon and some tracking error I encountered this evening just, yeah, it just wasn't that great. 
However, as I already mentioned, I have shot this comet uh, two weeks earlier. I was out with uh, Corne Auerhand and Sean de Mol, and we had about five minutes of clear sky time. So we uh, scrambled on a random parking lot and we uh, started shooting and I didn't make any video because I really wanted to focus on photographing. And uh, yeah, we also had a good laugh because uh, Corne really rented a Neanderthal suit uh, as he wanted yeah, to put himself as a subject in uh, that, that suit uh, under the comet. Uh, and yeah, I have to hand it to him. This might be one of the most original and creative shots I have seen uh, from this comet this year. And uh, Sean de Mol uh, brought his uh, yeah, semi-professional uh, deep sky setup. So yeah, he was uh, shooting with an uh, EQ6R uh, Pro mount and uh, with a dedicated cooled Astro camera. So yeah, his result is uh, yeah pretty good also for only five minutes of data. So yeah, I really didn't want to leave you guys empty handed. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this results uh, from uh, two weeks earlier. Uh, I also of course hope you really enjoyed the video and uh, thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Bye bye.